guess we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so, welcome. At this point, I've like talked to you all so much, I feel like we're best friends. Uh, today, we are going to talk about some AWS architectural decisions that we made and cool stuff that we kind of found out along the way to help us secure our CI system. So, <laughs> does anyone know anything about Evergreen? Cool, all right, we'll actually talk about that. So, but I'm assuming everyone knows what CI is, right? Sweet, okay. So, real quick, obviously everyone has to start with talking about themselves, so I'm gonna talk about me. Uh, my name is Matthew Robinson. I've been involved with Linux and FOSS for about 14 years now, and that's like my favorite stat because it makes me feel more impressive every year because it always goes up. Um, I'm a build engineer from MongoDB, um, and I've made a ton of FOSS projects that you've probably never heard of, but I'm super excited to talk about if you want to catch me after. So the first thing to kind of set you up for what we're going to talk about is I have to tell you about what we had and how it all kind of works today, and then talk about why the problem that came up is a problem. Um, so the first thing, is you know, what does a build engineer do, right? A lot of companies I know probably don't have build engineers, uh, but we do. And so what we do at Mongo is we keep Evergreen, which is our CI system, in a state where MongoDB can be built upon it, right? MongoDB is a big giant C++ program. Building them is not exactly straightforward and requires dependencies and all kinds of stuff in particular places. So our job is to make sure that the build hosts are able to do that and that like, the Evergreen architecture, or, sorry, infrastructure itself stays up and happy. So what is Evergreen? It's an in-house open source CI system built at MongoDB. So like the code is open, everything's great, you can go contribute if you want, uh, but we do build it in-house and we really build it for us. Like Evergreen is great and you can run your own instance, but it's like heavily customized to our use case, which is kind of specific. And one of the most specific things about it is that it's super scalable. Um, so the MongoDB compile and test suite, if you run it serially on one machine, meaning like one after the other, the whole run takes around 24 hours of computing time. Um, so the way that we've architected Evergreen allows us to parallelize that in such a way that we've gotten all of that down to two hours and we're targeting to get it down to 30 minutes uh, eventually. Um, and so the other cool thing that's kind of unique to Evergreen though, I know other CI systems have started doing this, and I think Travis has kind of always done this, is that it actually dynamically launches and tears down build hosts in the cloud. So when a task comes up, if there's no you know, host available, and there's like certain pressure on the system, it'll go out and make a new EC2 instance to run the task. And then when an EC2 instance sits around for whatever and is just wasting money, it goes, yeah, okay, you're done, and takes them off. <clears throat> this is kind of the front page of Evergreen. So ever, our Evergreen instance is like open, right? You can go look at it. It's at evergreen.mongodb.com. And if you go there, this is basically exactly what you'll see. So just to give you an idea of what this looks like, right? This is build variants. Um, so these are like platforms that we support and some other unique stuff. Um, that list goes on for basically forever and we'll be talking about that in a little bit. Um, but for each variant, you have all these tasks, and right? And each little box is a task and a green one is done and a red one has failed and a yellow one is happening and a gray one's waiting to be started, right? Um, there's not really anything super crazy there if you're familiar <coughs> with working with CI systems. What's really cool is that we run a lot of servers. Right, so to kind of handle that task load, because we build, build things that are not just MongoDB on this system, right? And so to handle that task load, we actually run dynamically these build hosts. And so this graph is actually like Evergreen's running build host count. So you see there, you know, like 5.30 or so, we're running like 1,500, 1,800 build hosts. And then it starts to scale down as people are like, you know, chit-chatting, getting close to the end of the day. And then right as everyone leaves at 6.30, everyone does a get push party, and Evergreen goes whoop and doubles the number of hosts to try and handle all the new incoming commits, right? So I, I really like this graph, but like you can see here, right, where we've got these kind of waves going on, right, where it's like dealing with stuff and, and getting rid of it. Um, so this is the way that Evergreen, we'll say is architected, uh, but was architected is probably more apropos as is with all architecture diagrams. Um, and we've, we've really got it simple here, right? And there's two VPCs, right? You've got your static VPC, and that holds the Evergreen app servers and static testing infrastructure. So there's like an LDAP instance out there that we use for testing LDAP features, Kerberos, and some other magic out there, Coverity, et cetera. Uh, and then this build host VPC is the special VPC. Um, sometimes we call this the dynamic VPC. This is where, you know, those servers that you see at launching, that's where all that is happening, is inside of that VPC. 
Um, and then MongoDB Atlas is just our cloud offering. It's, I think Amazon's called RDS or something like that, where you can basically say like, hey, give me a database, and it'll do it. We do the same thing, but for MongoDB, and it has extra features if you want to use MongoDB specific stuff, you can customize it a lot. Uh, it's not really pertinent to this talk, but it runs in a VPC out there somewhere too. So, just to give you an idea of like, I don't know, not to brag, but how hard my job is, um, these are all the platforms that MongoDB supports. And like this list seems totally reasonable, and there's nothing too crazy on there, right? Like Rails 6.2, all right, you know, Debian 7, okay. Uh, but the thing is that this list keeps going on, uh, and on, and on. And so here you're noting that like some of these platforms are kind of old. And if you're not sure what S390X is, that's a mainframe. And so I have to run mainframes and treat them like they're in the cloud. Um, so out of that list, though, these are the ones that like I truly loathe, like my absolute least favorite thing in the world. Um, and you might notice by looking at them, the one thing that they all share is that they're freaking ancient, right? I mean, RHEL 5.5 was end of life in May of 2015, and the AMI that we build on top of ships with Python 2.4 which, for instance, doesn't run Subscription Manager, which you need to register a Red Hat system to install packages. So that was a really fun one to solve. But these kinds of the things that like, they, 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 hate, they hate all of our automation, they hate the way that we do things, right? Like they're just too old to do a lot of stuff. TLS protocols, example, everybody's deprecating one and one one. None of these work with that, and so we had to fix that problem. Um, Cause the, and, and like the real underlying problem here is, is that like platform vendors love to support forwards compatibility, right? If you build it on RHEL 5.5, or I think Debian 7.1 is a much better example, it's probably gonna run on Debian 8.1, right? But they don't, they don't love to guarantee backwards compatibility. And as a software company, like the vast majority of our customers are enterprises and governments. And guess what those two entities don't do? Upgrade their systems. So if I wanna say MongoDB can run on your system, as you know, let's say some large institution that never does upgrades, then I have to be able to build it on this old platform that you're actually running so that I can guarantee that it will work there, right? Because C++ programs are, you know, building them is a finicky business in the first place, and so like, you, you gotta be real sure it's gonna work. Is, is, quick question, is there a reason why Amazon Linux 2013 is still being used, because? Yes, because people are using Amazon Linux 2013, and they pay us, so. Um, and so we have to lock to that really old version. We do also support Amazon Linux 2, and we just added a separate like platform for that. Uh-oh. All right, we're good. Um, Maybe we can chat afterwards. Yeah, yeah, I'm super happy to, super happy to talk about it afterwards. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of what it comes down to. Now, if you're wondering, Matt, if you're running these systems, how do you sleep at night? And the answer is our security group strategy, which is basically, yeah, if you're not coming from these four servers, or one of our office computers, you don't touch anything on these instances, right? Like, we, we block everything with extreme prejudice. Um, and that's not our only layer, but that's like the first layer and definitely the one that we like really are, are hardcore about not changing at all, if we can, right? Now, with all that in mind, let's talk about the actual problem that came up with the way that we architected the system. So, MongoDB, it's a database, right? It has a storage engine, and we actually have multiple storage engines. It's really cool. You can actually swap out like the back end of MongoDB and still have the query layer and all that stuff that you expect, and it works the same to, regardless of how it's storing the data. The problem is, is that when we write that storage engine, we have to test what happens when you have like a power failure or somebody gets squirrely and presses the reboot button and doesn't shut MongoDB off first, right? And to like understand how that works and how we can kind of account for that and prevent data loss in those kinds of situations, we have to be able to test it right, in meaningful ways. So basically, before the 3.6 release came out, you know, someone was like, all right, we need to do power cycle testing, yada, yada, yada. And the problems with that right, is that they're going to need to run EC2 instances. Right? They're going to need to be able to uh, reboot those instances. You're going to be testing like with a driver, right? So they've gotta be able to talk both ways because you don't know which end is gonna have the driver and which end is gonna have the server, right? And if I want them to clean up after themselves, I gotta give them the ability to terminate these EC2 instances. So I'm sure at least you're aware, uh, but AWS runs on money, right? Uh, and this instance is coming out of my budget. So when you know our budget doubles because they got squirrely and had a bug or something, 
and VP of Engineering is at my desk, oh, I don't know, is not a great answer to why the budget doubled this month, right? So we've got to say, hey, you've got to clean up after yourselves. The problem with giving those kinds of permissions, right, is like, how do I let them do that without touching my stuff, right? If you can reboot and terminate EC2 instances, right, and I give you in my account, that means that you can reboot and terminate Evergreen, like our app servers or other people's build hosts, right? And so how do we work around this while opening the minimum amount of ports as well, right? If we could get everything on the private network or something like that, then like, you know, it's less of a problem, but if you've got to come across the internet because we can't solve the first challenge, right? How do I do that without saying, well, I'm gonna let you in from anywhere, right? Zero, zero, zero slash zero is a thing we don't do, right? And, and kind of playing off that, right, is can we get it over private networking? Because if we can, then I can be less, we'll say paranoid with my security group rules, right? So the first kind of solution, right, everyone's just like, here's the easy one, let's just give them the access, right? We have our AWS account, and, uh, okay, uh, so just give them the access, right? We have our AWS account, and so we just give them API keys, right? And like I already said, right, that means that they can terminate Evergreen, they can terminate other people's stuff. Um, sort of in that same realm, they actually hit our limits. So like the API rate limit, like you can only make so many API requests in, in, in a certain amount of time. And so Evergreen running 1500 blah instances, am I stepping on something or like? Check their streaming box. I'm gonna stand right here. Okay, so, um, all right, that's where I was. So, you know, as you can imagine, right, spinning up and spinning down a bunch of instances, Evergreen makes a ton of API requests and in so doing, hits that rate limit, or pushes the rate limit on its own. So as soon as our users were gonna start doing stuff in our account, they were gonna push us over that limit. We're gonna break their stuff, they're gonna break our stuff, no one's gonna be happy, right? So the next thing was, we were like, okay, well what if we just like, create a little VPC form, right? And just say, there you go, there's your own VPC. Um, problems we ran into that. So first off, the IAM policies for locking a user account down to a single VPC is like not straightforward, right? IAM policies can be kind of complicated on their own right out of the box. Uh, and so when you start trying to do this stuff, that's like, to, to give you an idea, the documentation on that is like three pages long and like requires you to change settings in three different places. And then also when you're launching an EC2 instance, you have to set certain flags basically. And so that it knows like, hey, this is mine and stuff and like, Going off of that, some of our tools did not support those extra flags on the EC2 instances. So uh, one of the use cases that we actually wanted to move to the new model that I'll show you at the end here, right, is package testing. It uses Test Kitchen, which is like a chef thing. And the EC2 driver straight up does not support what is required to do a VPC specific permissions. Um, and then even if you put them in on VPC, the limits are still shared, the API rate limit, et cetera. And the billing is still shared, so like they're still showing up on my bill. And the AWS billing screen, if you've never seen it, uh, is kind of like spaghetti and alphabet soup mixed together. Uh, so like trying to decide who did what and why you got what is hard. And then when you throw reserved instances, which we have into the mix, it gets real complicated because like you'll be running like an M3 medium and you'll be getting like an R4X large, but the price will be cheaper than an M4 medium. And you're like, we're, we're not running any R4X servers. What's going on here? So, you know. That is a, is, a, is a problem in its own right. It was around this time that we got the idea to just use another AWS account, right? We were like, that seems like it makes a lot of sense, right? You get separate billing, right? You get separate permissions, you get separate limits, and it seems like all the stuff that we wanted to do was gonna happen, right? So if I give you your own AWS account and you got a bug in your script, right? Your bug, your bug in your script is only gonna blow up your stuff, it's not gonna blow up my stuff, and there's pretty much no way you can get around that unless you have API keys wrong, which would be weird since I had to give them to you. Uh, so, but the problem here is, right, the networking challenge, right? So if you put them in a separate AWS account, now you're talking about coming across the internet. And like I said before, right, our security group strategy is this, right? I don't want you to come across the internet because I don't want to open anything up to the internet. And like, because of the way that Amazon handles uh, signing public IPs 
to these instances, right, the IPs are all different. So there's no way for me to be like, oh, you're this. And like the only way around that is to be like, well, here, I'm gonna give you security group editing permissions in my account. And you can like add your instance specifically to the right ports, which seems like a really great idea until they have a bug and they delete all my security group rules, right? So that's not what we wanted to do either. Um, thankfully, we thought of some options. The first option we thought of to kind of solve this problem was is a NAT gateway. Um, so does anyone know, not know what like network address translation is? Okay, so network address translation is what happens basically on consumer grade routers. All the traffic goes there, right? And the IP on this side of it is one thing, but when it gets here and it gets out past that point, the IP is one IP, it's the IP of the router, right? Or the NAT gateway in this example. So you can see there, it turns all traffic into a single origin IP. Um, for all intents and purposes, it works just like a consumer grade router. It's really, really great for writing security group rules inside of your VPC, right? Because you can like kind of keep it to one rule because you can make everything go through one IP. Um, and in case you don't know, there is a limit on the number of rules you can have on a security group, as we found out. Um, and so <clears throat> that's really, it's kind of your target use case. Um, the big problems we ran into truly with this was that the routing table rules were not very fun and they were hard to debug. It does not play super great with internet gateways. Um, getting traffic to go between gateways like that was not straightforward in any way. And once we did get it set up, it basically didn't work the way we wanted it to because the internet gateway was kind of doing its own NAT and like blew away the NAT gateway translation. And so when you needed to talk back, you had to talk back over the other instances public DNS anyway. And so saw, you know, that kind of blew that solution out of the water. But we had to leave AWS's private network to do that. So from that point, we started thinking about like, okay, so we have this other account, we have this other VPC, and instead of trying to find ways to like trick it into one IP or trying to get it across the internet in a way that we're gonna be happy about, like a VPN or something weird, right? Can we just like somehow pop these two private networks, right? And it actually turns out that AWS has got your back. They have this feature called VPC peering. It's super cool. And the VPC peer works pretty much like any other gateway except that it just hops across VPCs. So you can say like, I wanna to go to that 10 dot whatever IP address from this instance and it'll go across VPC peering connection, goes all over the private network, everything's hunky dory. What that is really cool is that like, it actually works across AWS accounts too, right? So you get all these benefits of having multiple AWS accounts, right? The separate billing, the separate permissions. Uh, you know, I can give my developers blanket access in that account and they can do whatever they need, which is like hard to, uh, hard to understate the benefit of because the next time they have a use case like this, they don't need to come ask me, right? And I'm no longer like the blocker guy. It's like, you already have the account. Just do what you need, right? Do what you want. I don't care what you do in there. I can see what you're doing and like when Dan is upset, well, Dan's our VP, by the way. <laughs> when Dan's upset at me, right, like I can be like, Dan, that's their bill, I don't know. And then it's acceptable to say, I don't know. <clears throat> and so like, you know, with the VPC peering, right, you get to network over the private IP, all traffic is coming across the VPC peer when you're talking over those private IPs. And what's super duper dope is that it's only one security group rule because the security groups actually allow you to specify the VPC peering connection ID as the source. So anyone who's familiar with writing security group rules knows that you can specify a security group as a source. You can do the exact same thing for this VPC peer. So it's like this extra layer of comfort knowing that like, oh, I didn't mess up my CIDR block. Like I know it's coming from there, right? Um, and so you can peer across AWS accounts. Now at this point, I'm sure everyone's thinking like, yeah, this is the end. We're gonna do a freeze frame victory pose, high fives all around and Everything was great and wonderful. Except, it was at this point that we had to build it, right? And we realize now that like, oh, this is all great and well and wonderful to talk about, right? It sounds super straightforward when you're talking about it, but when you go to do it, it is a giant pain. Um, I mean, the AWS UI <coughs> is serviceable, but it's not great in its own right, but this is, is an extra special pain, even so. To demonstrate this point, I have built a picture book to walk you through this process. 
So you can see here that we have two web browsers, right? And the reason for this is, is because AWS does not allow you to log into multiple accounts in one browser, and it doesn't have any kind of way for you to really like easily switch between accounts, right? So we needed two separate, basically, browser sessions. You could use an incognito window. I use two browsers because I have to routinely do this, so I want one to save my creds and whatever, right? So here we got Chrome and Firefox, and I'm sure you all know, right? You're gonna, you gotta create a VPC first. So you go to the VPC dashboard, you hit start VPC wizard, everything's great. You fill out the information, right? And, and I really hope that you loved filling out that information because guess what? You get to do it all again in the same account or the other account, basically filling out the exact same information for the most part. Um, and after that, you've got your two VPCs created, right? So uh, here we've got the, got the production dynamic VPC and the production power cycle testing VPC in the other account. From there, you're gonna go ahead and go create your peering connections. So you go to peering connections on the left and you see this wonderful create peering connection button. And I'm sure looking at that, you're just like, this is gonna be easy, it's gonna be great. And so, just like before, you open it up and the screen wigs out, apparently. What's going on is, we had this yesterday, is that the refresh rate on your computer, it detected like a, uh, this is 59 point something hertz, you need to set it to 60, it will we'll stop flashing. All right, let's see if we can knock this out real quick. All right, that's not encouraging. Well, now it's not even detecting the other display. I mean, I can hold the laptop and walk around like Vanna White style, or? <laughs> you could bypass the recording box, too. I mean, they won't get the slides recorded, but it'll, we can see it. So that would be yesterday morning. Just go straight to the projector. If I was smart enough to do that, we would do that. I think it just worked. OK, it, it worked. Or did for a second. I bet this has got a short in it. I bet it has a short in it, because that's what it's acting like. I if someone knows how to bypass the box, I will bypass the box. Yeah, just so where it comes out off that box, just plug, just, just plug that into your laptop. The DVI? Is it DVI or is it HDMI? Oh, you mean here, this blue one? Yeah, I guarantee that's a projector. So just pop that in yours. You should. All right. Hopeful, hopeful, hopeful. Hmm. Is your refresh rate now on 60 hertz? I don't have an option to change that. Or if I do, it's on the other window or thing. And there's nothing I can kind of do about that. Oh, it's set to mirror. Well, it's not mirror. Okay. 
super fun. Yeah, it's yeah, super fun. Does it look like I'm working again? It just wasn't scheduling in the chain very well. Slowly. We bypassed the recording box. Yeah. Hey, we bypassed the recording box. I guess it works. Oh. Okay. They won't get it next time. Okay, so do you have at least audio? Gotcha. Testing, testing. One, two, three, testing. So it should be that problem. Okay, because yeah, the, uh, the broadcaster's having issues, so he's directly plugged in. So I think this problem has become another audio one. Okay, sweet. Okay, so, for the audio listeners, I will adequately describe this. There are forms, forms all around. Um, so, no, I'm, I'm sorry for the audio listeners. Um, so, okay, so this is our VPC Dream Connection Creation screen, right? And we, again, just like before, we've opened this in both accounts. We're gonna fill out mostly the same information, but this is where it really starts to break down for you. Like, this is where you like, start to notice problems. So like one, you have to know the account IDs. So you've got this third browser window that's over here somewhere with all your account IDs listed out and you have to remember which one goes which where and you have to get the names right like because you want it to be like this VPC to this VPC and that VPC to this VPC. And like, I mean, as a side note, like I've done this before and this screenshot's actually wrong and I didn't even notice it until I like put the screenshot in but the names are actually reversed, right? And I'm, literally done this exact thing before building this exact same character here connection. So like, it's a real pain. It's like full of human errors. Um, and you might be getting through that process and seeing your two, you know, peering connections and thinking that you're done. But I've got bad news for you. When you create a VPC peering connection across two accounts, what you've created is not a VPC peering connection. You have created two VPC peering connection requests. And so now you have to wait for those requests to come across the accounts and accept them on both ends. And I can't blame you for thinking that you created a peering connection because everything in the freaking UI says that you created a peering connection. But no. And if you read the docs, it's like in like the last paragraph about this that like, oh, if you're doing it across accounts, it's a request and you have to like do some stuff and then wait for it and you have to accept it. And because we love doing the same thing twice, you have to do it on both ends again. That makes sense. Yeah, right? Yeah, so um, so obviously that was painful, right? It was error prone, time consuming, right? Like, you know, I messed it up many, many times doing it the first time. And the worst part is that you're not even done yet, right? Once you've done that and you've got the VPC peering connection accepted on both ends, now you have to go create your security group rules in both accounts and you have to create routes in both accounts so that the VPC will send stuff to that private CIDR across the UPC peering connection. Because if you don't do that, it just kind of was like, well, I don't have that CIDR blocking me, and yeah, you're done. And just drops all the traffic. Which is really confusing, um, and not, you know, fun. Uh, perhaps worse than all of this is what it does to your architecture. So I'm sure all of you remember this slide, right? This is beautiful, right? It's just simple, just three pieces. You don't have to really think about it too much. Uh, but now that you've got two accounts, it looks like this. Um, and there's a lot more going on here, right? Like these rectangles are separate accounts in AWS and you've got the VPC peering connections on both ends. You've got all these internet gateways laying around. You've got the dragon stuff, which is my mainframes. Don't worry about those, you know? And the worst part about this is, is that like these arrows, you know, they look straightforward-ish, right? But what we do for all of our VPCs and the other accounts is that we create a subnet per availability zone so realistically, you've got like six of these arrows and like which one's the public subnet and which one does what is kind of weird. And so this really starts to look like spaghetti real quick the closer it gets to reality, right? And like the AWS UI, again, does not support multiple accounts super well, right? It's very hard to like find stuff. And what's weird is Amazon totally knows the accounts are linked because you can share reserved instances across them. So it totally knows that that's like my account, right? But even with proper tagging, which some people don't do, I, I, and I don't envy you, but some people, like even if you have it, right, like searching for something in this kind of model is a super duper pain, right? I've got to remember which account it's in in the first place, and then like nine times out of 10, I didn't remember right, and I went to the wrong one, and I looked, I'm like, ah, hey, developer guy, I can't find your instance, I'm sorry. Oh, I was in the wrong account, you know? Like, that makes you look dumb and feel dumb, right? So, like, it's, it's, it's diff difficult to find things. 
Um, so what do we do about this? The answer is Terraform, right? This is kind of like the standard DevOps solution at this point, right? It's we automated it, and generally speaking, you automate it with some kind of HashiCorp tool because they're like, they're like the people, right? Like that's what they do. Um, and so, using Terraform, we were able to like easily manage our infrastructure across multiple environments, right? So, like as an example before, all that stuff that we did for that one peering connection, right? We manage a stage and a production environment, and we want to maintain all the infrastructure for both. So you had to do that you know, two times per use case, and out of the box, we had three use cases lined up that, like, power cycle testing was one of those, but we had two other things we wanted to do this way. So you're gonna do that process six times. So obviously, we were like, yeah, we really need to find a way to, to kind of solve this. And so the benefits of Terraform are at this point, like, super well documented, right? Like, everyone in this room knows that infrastructure code, or, I'm sorry, infrastructure as code is, like, cool, right? And you get source control, so you can track the changes to your infrastructure over time using Git, you know, you get code reviews, so like nobody accidentally deletes the production database server, right? Like everyone gets a chance to look at everything and it's kind of well documented. And I say documented in quotes, like heavy quotes, because sometimes you look at like a module or a resource block in Terraform as a human and you're like, I don't know what that's gonna do, right? Even if you know Terraform, you're like, ah, I have no idea what's really gonna happen there. And so like, it's documented in that like, you know these resources exist, right? But you don't really know what they are. But that, that's the other great thing, is that Terraform kind of fixes that finding stuff problem too. Because the Terraform state is queryable. And it's synchronized, you can synchronize it using um, like remote backends is what we do, we use S3 for that. And so like, you can basically say like, if you can look at that resource block and get the name out of it, right? What you can do, it's like, oh, it's like the first thing you have to specify when you make a resource or a module is, you know, you get the name, and so now you can say, like, show me that resource, right? And it will tell you everything you wanted to know about it. It'll even tell you what account it's in, so that when you go to actually find it in the UI to do something to it, or if you can do it in the Terraform, you will. But, like, when you need to find it, you can find it here. And state list is a sweet, like, greppable thing. So, like, if you're not really sure what you're looking for, and you're not really sure where it is in the code, you can state list, pipe that to a grep, and try and pull that out. Um, and so for the last point about automating awkward UIs away, you know, AWS UI, actually out of all the cloud providers, is pretty good, right? But we have other cloud providers, so we actually use it to automate all of those away. And to kind of demonstrate the point, those screenshots that I showed you before about the process, the manual process, I have compiled our code that literally builds that exact same thing so you can see how much simpler this is. So the first thing you have to do in Terraform is you have to set up your providers. So a provider is a cloud provider. And so you'll see here that we have two AWS providers. This basically sets up the two accounts, right? So if you want to do two different accounts, you have to set up two AWS providers specifying the account. Profile there is the profile block in your AWS credentials file. So if you've ever like taken a look at the thing, it's basically just TOML. I don't know if it's like actually TOML, it might be the weird anything that Python does out of the box, but either way, it's got like a TOML-esque header. And there'll be like a name there, and that tells you what the profile is. So that there tells it which basically API keys to pull. Then you've got to create that first VPC. So that thing that you know we had to do in the in the one account, right, is right here. Um, this is a module call. So Terraform modules are a lot like functions in programming languages, right? They encapsulate some kind of functionality. They take inputs and they produce an output when they're done, and you can get stuff about the return values. Um, here, this is a module that we wrote that loosely wraps the official Terraform VPC module. And basically, like, whenever we create a VPC, we create them with, like, 95% the same defaults and, like, change a few things. And so this just kind of automates that for us so that we don't have to write the same stuff, like, 15 times. Um, and then this here is the real magic. This is the part that, like, we're really talking about here. And this is creating the peer VPC. So what this module does is this takes both of your accounts... And what it calls the peer account is that secondary account. So it's going to go out to that secondary account. It's going to create that new VPC for you with all the availability zones and everything the way you want it. And you can do that with all the options here. There's more to it than what's on this slide if you want. But it's going to go do all that. And once it creates that secondary account, then what it's going to do is it's going to create an internet gateway, some public subnets, etc. And then it's going to create the VPC peer connection on both ends and automatically accept it on both ends set up routes in both routing tables to route all the traffic to the VPC peering connection, 
And then it's going to set up security group rules if you ask it to, but generally speaking, we do all that outside of that module. But this thing can tag all those resources and you can tag them individually, like you can get real granular. But I have really, really good news. This module that we wrote to do this is actually open source because MongoDB is an open source company and we're kind of cool like that, right? And so if you go to github.com slash MongoDB, you can find this module and steal it and use it. And we're not in the registry yet, but I'm hoping we will be, but there's some stuff around that that I can talk about later. But to kind of summarize everything, right, to give you like the sweet takeaways, like if anyone wanted to take a picture of a slide, this is the one to take a picture of, is that Terraform's awesome, you should use it. I don't think anyone's like shocked by that, like automation's cool, yeah, all right. Kind of like get in the picture. But um, so like no one's shocked by this, right? Like everyone loves automation here, I'm sure, or like everyone's like seen the benefits of writing a script or some other thing. Evergreen's neat, right? It's neato, you should check it out. If you like Go code, it's a big giant Go program. Um, but the thing that I think that's kind of unique and the thing that we discovered in this process was that AWS accounts make for great security containers and they don't get in the way of developers doing their job, right? And that because of that, VPC peering allows you to reasonably work across those accounts from an infrastructure and networking perspective, right? Since VPC peering exists, if you're doing everything right, and you're doing anything in Terraform, it's really, really easy to empower your developers to do whatever they need to do to get their job done and not get in their way and be able to sleep at night at the same time, right? Well, that being said, uh, this is the time for questions. Um, if no one understood anything I talked about or like doesn't like what I talked about, I also like to talk about those things. So you can ask me questions about any of those topics as well. Anybody? Anybody? All right. Well, was that comprehensive? Um, can you talk a little bit about how your Evergreen interacts with your um, Git repository, what you use for your Git repository, and how it can kick off the Evergreen jobs through, like, do you use Git, like, your, your, own, your own homebrew Git server, or are you using GitLab? Or so we use GitHub. Okay. Um, the way Evergreen works, though, you can point it at anything. It does polling right now. Um, it does support pull request testing now. So for that, like if you want PR testing the way that's integrated with GitHub, obviously you gotta use GitHub. Uh, but anything else, it basically just has like this process that goes out there and it goes like, all right, what's your project? All right, that's where you are. And it looks it up. And so it says, is there a new commit? Yeah, okay, build it. Anyone? Just a quick question. That, um, what, what exactly we what modules were you using from HashiCorp, in other words? Um... So they have a module on the registry literally called VPC. Okay. And so all we did was create our own module that calls that module and just like sets defaults. Okay, thank you. All right, all right. Heard it was pretty clear. Okay, yeah, sweet, all right, right. yeah, yeah. You guys see my face twice. That's my favorite part about that slide. Okay, well, I think we're done then. If anyone wants to hit me afterwards, I'll talk about whatever. Yeah.